Order, order. Let me start our second panel. Um, I wonder, um, Stefan, could we start with you? Could you um, introduce yourself and uh, the organisation you're representing? Yes, um, I'm Stefan Dirkon. I'm a professor of economic policy at the Blavatka School of Government at the University in Oxford. Thank you very much. Um, Ian. Hi, uh, I'm Ian Mitchell. I'm a senior policy fellow and co-director of our Europe programme at the Centre for Global Development, a think tank in Washington. And <coughs> Thank you very much. And Michael. I'm Michael Collier. I'm Professor of Geography at the University of Sussex. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Stefan, my first question is to you, please. Statistics recently published by the FCDO show the government spent nearly 10% of the aid budget supporting <coughs> refugees in the UK in 2021. This is likely to have increased this year due to the support being provided to um, Ukrainian refugees too. Do you think spending this proportion of aid in the UK is an effective or and or ethical use of the ODA budget? Well, well thank you very much. Um, maybe the first point to make is that, as far as I'm concerned, the issue is not whether the government should spend on refugees or asylum seekers and, and pay the housing costs. I think the previous panel has talked about the, if these people, of course, have a lot of needs. For me, the important question here is whether it should be ODA that is used for that spending. And maybe it's helpful to briefly remind you of what the definition is of ODA. It's official development assistance, which is, you know, government aid is defined by the OECD as government aid that promotes and specifically targets the economic development and welfare of developing countries. So definitely my point is that if we go to the ethics of it, we've clearly pushed the definition very, very, very far. And, and we pushed it in a way to suit our needs, basically fiscal needs to try to actually find ways of covering budgets in other ways. And it's important to also understand <laughs> that you know, these rules are made by the DAC, by the OECD. Of course, we make these rules, and the UK has been pushing, together with other countries, admittedly, over the years to make this definition broader and broader and broader, further from what actually the official definition is. Or put it differently, that the rules allow all kinds of spending to do this. The ethical question becomes then, when we are now getting in a situation where we've been pushing these rules, and we also apply these rules, not necessarily in the way that it was intended, because the rules are not rules that you have to uh, call everything that's within these guidelines as ODA. You're allowed to report them as ODA. You don't have to. And so I know government holds another position uh, in public, but actually they don't have to count this as ODA. And um, we, we have to admit that these expenses that we have at the moment with a policy decision to exceptionally and at an extreme high level to support Ukrainian refugees and to some extent Afghans, we actually are crowding out the rest of the ODA budget. We didn't have to put these costs on the ODA budget. We do. And therefore, we actually make an ethical choice to say that the needs for this group for which we make a very particular decision are, and in an exceptional way, a group that we support in an exceptional way, we actually um, allow that to crowd out support for extreme situations in Africa or in Asia. And so, is it ethical? I think that's, um, I would say, no, it's, uh, we've pushed it very far. Is it effective? I think the previous panel has been addressing it. Is it effective use of government resources? Obviously, quick decisions, maybe getting these people rights to work and having a quick resolution of their cases would make it far more effective. But I think that's not the issue. The issue for me is really, should we have actually booked on order to the extent that we're doing? And I don't think that's correct, that's fair, and indeed, that's not ethical. Stefan, you were the chief economist of the Department for International Development between 2011 and 2017. Um, was the UK attributing spend like this to ODA then? And if the Foreign Secretary or the, the Chancellor was coming to you um, suggesting that we did, what would you have said? So, okay, so in this period when I was chief economist, and I should do for full disclosure, I was I worked as a civil servant later on as a policy advisor to Roy Stewart when he was Secretary of State, 
I also worked as a policy advisor to Dominic Raab and indeed um, briefly for Liz Truss. Um, and in that period, I've seen all the time actually the following, which is repeated attempts to put strong pressure on our representatives in the DAC to broaden the rules and make them actually broader and broader that we could put more and more spending on it. It was sometimes you could say there's a reasonable case to be made, other times uh, it got all uh, very out of hand. I must say the refugee, the counting of refugee costs even predates that. But there was a time that this was really tiny. But actually the main issue has been, we've been trying to use our budget more and more as a fallback position for costs that we don't really want to put on other budgets, and therefore actually squeezing out development. This budget is increasingly not a development budget in the way that even uh, former speakers, previous speakers were describing where we should be working on inside these countries. This is increasingly a budget to plug holes. Um, and, and so this was counted in that period, but the, the costs were, relatively speaking, small. So this was maybe not the things to fight on. I can only repeat the battles I had as policy advisor, trying to push back all the time what we did with the special drawing rights. No, the country does this. What we did with the vaccine costs, we charge more than actually the multilaterals would cost if they were buying them themselves and so on. So we, we, we do this, we basically treat this budget as a way of creative accounting rather than a budget where we say in the spirit of let's actually try to use this really effectively for development. And I think over time it got worse. Um, Boris Johnson came to the chamber and described the uh, ODA budget as the cash point in the sky. Um, so is that accurate for how it's being used now? Well, um, <laughs> well, maybe, yes, indeed, it's maybe the, I, I, I like your analogy, maybe it becomes the cash point for departments that, that somehow can squeeze some budgets that they don't, that are, con that they don't, uh, don't, are not able to control onto the budget. So, so yes, it's this may be appropriate, although the Prime Minister at the time used it probably in another spirit, um, with an unfortunate analogy. I also will say that, um, uh, Andrew Mitchell, very correctly, the current minister, very correctly said it was a very unfortunate uh, use of, of language. But indeed, we see this, and we saw this actually from my time as chief economist, increasingly attempts to find ways of charging things that maybe initially would have been not counted as ODA to count as ODA. And then all the time saying, we have to do this. And this is actually not true. It's a rule by the Treasury that we do it. It's not a rule from the DAC that we must report it. Other countries don't do this, as uh, they do it for some of these things. The US, for example, really doesn't like this and has been always pushing back for our attempts to change the rules and to, to, to put it further. So it's not something we should be very proud of, and I hope we can slowly put a stop to this and actually go back to development spending in the spirit of the original definition, i.e. trying to actually help to develop these countries um, and um, and, and use it wisely in that respect. Thank you. Um, briefly, Michael, should we be spending uh, so much odour in the UK? Um, I'd agree with Stefan that I think we have to emphasise this is a, a voluntary position and if we, we take a slightly longer historical view, this has been allowable under DAC rules since 1988. Um, the, the UK pushed back against that for a very long time and didn't allow any DAC spending to go on refugee uh, expenditures in the UK until 2009 when it was a, a couple of million and then it was David Cameron's announcement that development should be a whole of government responsibility was his phrase that really started a, a significant expansion in this so I think that um, you know, if the choice is between supporting refugees in the UK which as everyone has said is, is clearly something which should be done um, and spending um, to support um, poverty reduction programs in very low-income countries, for example. I think the choice is clear that it, it needs to go to, to areas where poverty reduction can be much more effective. Um, but, as, as um, I think Enver said in the previous panel, it shouldn't be an either-or decision. That's the, uh, that's the way I would frame it. Thank you. Ian? Thanks. Yeah, I just had a couple of points. I, I also agree with, with nearly all of what Stefan said. I mean, on the point of the, the odour definition, um, I think this is an important point. You know, if you, if you set the rules by having a, a committee entirely made up of providers with no recipients in it, then, then over time the definition is eroded. 
and, and with a government that is looking to make an alternative offer to developing countries that is different from China, that is more open and honest and fair, um, than, than a system where you can count many things as, as ODA, um, which don't even benefit the developing country, I think is, is one that's unsustainable. And, and I think that, I think, you know, at the margin, ODA is overcounted and it undermines the whole concept um, and, and even, you know, the, the, the wider sort of economic model. Uh, the other point I'd, I'd make is, um, I, mean, I mean, Stefan's alluded to this, but, but the real problem is lots of us, including me and, and members of this committee, you know, think of the ODA budget. And, and we've been indoctrinated in that by the Treasury approach of, of treating it as a ceiling, a maximum, you know, a fixed envelope regardless of events. And, um, and I still, people, still, still see people talking it, about it like that. It wouldn't be so bad if we were just counting the refugee spend as ODA. Um, that, and reporting it as such, that the problem is that we're reducing another budget. Um, and, and on the ethical question, you know, I think we have to take the government at, at what it said. You know, Prime Minister Johnson said the UK would have a, a very generous approach to Ukrainian refugees, but surely that's not consistent with, with asking your lower-income country partners to, to fund it. So, so I think that the government has answered that question itself. Thank you. David? Yes, Ian, can, can we stick with you, and can I ask you what potential effects could increases in aid spending in the, U uh, in the UK have on levels and outcomes of the UK's uh, aid spending overseas? Yeah, so we, we've done some projections of um, what the costs could be. And, and it's, it's perhaps worth noting that I mean, the number of um, asylum seekers from small boat crossings has, has materially increased. I mean, that is a, is a real change. A few years ago, we were talking about hundreds, and now we're talking about tens of thousands. And of course, the you know 180,000 or so Ukrainian refugees is you know is a, is a dramatic increase in the number of, of refugees arriving. So I think if depending on how much the government um, reports as ODA, we think that the costs in in this year 2022 could be three billion, um, and next year could be around 2.7 billion just from the arrivals this year and the and the, and the flow of the costs. So putting that in the context of um, the total, if, if that came out of the fixed envelope ODA budget, that would be um, a quarter um, of, of the budget. Um, the Treasury, uh, the, um, the, the autumn statement, did make some extra provision of, of a billion this year and one and a half next year. Um, but we don't think that will be enough to protect the remaining aid budget from cuts. And, and the, the reduced budget that the FCDO has now received um, is, is 600 million less than it was last year, and um, perhaps a billion below where FCDO expected it to be. And so that is the level of cuts that they are having to implement at the moment to accommodate those costs. Stefan, can I follow that uh, up, up with you? Because you've said previously um, that ODA spending on overseas bilateral programmes could be as low as 3 billion in uh, 2022 because of uh, what Ian has identified as being spent uh, in the in the UK. Well, what did you base that assessment on and you know, what, what would the effect of such cuts look like in, in practice? Well, look, it's, I, I definitely didn't base it based on the data that our government in Freedom of Information request was supplying, <laughs> but uh, Ian has done a, a brilliant job in this respect. And um, and uh, also others. So working also with Ronald Disenyake, uh, we've we've uh, we've been trying to recreate some partly based on Ian's figures and some others that were in the public domain. And the way to think about it is that you know the uh, and, and make sure we have no misunderstanding. You know the think of the ODA budget consisting of three large parts. One part is this: all these things that get taken off the budget even before FCDO can start thinking about spending it on development, of which, of course, the, the Ukraine costs and the housing costs of refugees and so on are all part of it. And if we then think that it may well be, even you know, uh, based on the numbers that the Prime Minister was quoting today, maybe two billion, but we think it's probably going to be the three to five billion uh, from from next year. Uh, we also have to know that there are multilateral obligations that we actually commit to, and they're a bit longer term. They're already much less than we used to do, but think of it, Global Fund, World Bank, and other kinds of things. If that's about $4 billion, you know, you, you actually get for the total budget that exists in OTA. These $3 billion is roughly the number that you get up at, at uh, as well. 
But that three billion is bilateral, basically spending we do directly partnership with the countries. Actually, it's not even the money that gets to these countries because it also includes things like research and things like um, some other spending we may be doing much more indirectly with them. I'm at the moment actually spending a lot of time and talking to you from Madagascar, where they basically have no budget anymore. Uh, I was in Ethiopia, where over the last four years, the budget has been reduced by 90%. That's basically the budget that our teams on the ground can control. These budgets have basically been decimated, and they are spread now very thinly, but but we Really, uh, they, 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 they've gone through their third round of cuts now, and uh, yeah, that keeps on, keeps on, keeps on happening. And this is the things we do really as closely with the partner governments, with local organisations on the ground. And these budgets are essentially decimated. So, if it's three billion, I don't know. Maybe, hopefully, one, one at some point, we're allowed to see the, their budget. But I think actually it may well be even less than that. Okay, and I mean, you've given some examples there of the sort of programmes and, and set countries uh, that have been uh, most uh, affected. I mean, is there, was, was there any pattern to that or, or a um, logic or a proposal or, or is it your interpretation that it's sort of entirely no, random no. what has happened? No, no, I, I will, no, I definitely will never accuse my, my former colleagues in FCDO that they actually will try to do this randomly. One of my things I had to do under Dominic Raab, after I'd been hired, within a few weeks our cut, budget was cut by 4 billion when we moved to 0.5, and I've been staring at these spreadsheets forever. There is no reasonable way of cutting billions of a budget. You know, you're locked in with contracts, you can't do it, you can't necessarily optimize for value for money, you make some programs unviable. Actually, it is just chaos. Actually, it is just total chaos. Value for money, by the way we do these things, by all the time at the last minute getting all these numbers and these cuts through, we just basically, um, not just decimating programs and the budgets itself from it, but actually a whole idea of having a coherent, consistent portfolio of development action, that's disappeared. I think Minister Mitchell has alluded to it. The budget is larger than when it was when he was the minister first time. And then you now we have 0.55 of a slightly larger GDP than the 0.51 or something he had at the time. But actually, at the time, we could build up a coherent budget. We were not just permanently victims, and I'm sorry, I'm still talking we, I've been long enough a civil servant <laughs> in the system. Um, but it, it, when, when I'm sitting in the chair there as a civil servant, as a policy advisor to ministers, you just take it all the time. And it is a bit like what Ian was saying. you know. These budgets are, are, are not set in stone that you have to cut these things. If you have unexpected contingency, which is generosity towards Afghanistan and generosity at a huge scale relative to Ukraine, that actually you don't have to stick to the point five. You're allowed to go over that because these are contingency, unpredictable things. But at the moment, good, long-term, careful development programs are being decimated across the world, whether via multilateral or bilaterals, because of the total and that is actually the more random events, because a sudden commitment to do very large sums of money that nobody can control within the FCDO or within the development <coughs> colleagues, actually that's the consequence. No. So, I mean, in the present arrangements, there's really no capacity for prioritisation then? No, they, they, will, they will do it, you know. And look, and we tried to do it at the time with Dominic Raab. We kind of identified seven areas. But the problem is somehow is lock-in, because, you know, at the same time, these budgets are liable to endless ring fences that uh, the Treasury imposes. So you have all the global commitments to climate, the global commitments to all kinds of stuff. But that actually means, you know, you, you, your hands are tied. And that actually is why these budgets that go really directly locally in terms of the bilateral program, why they always are the victim and that where they cut most. And then it becomes very hard to prioritize because then it becomes an issue of, you know, how you can, how you can rethink, re, re, reorganize and so on, these types of things. You know, it's just the scale that, that the scale involved makes a very rational approach to rebuild a sensible development budget really hard in the current circumstances. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Kate. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to start asking uh, my question to Michael. Michael, aid spending on refugees in the UK has risen dramatically over the past few years. What do you think are the main reasons for this rise? 
I think the, as we've already said, we have to focus on choice, that this isn't inevitable. There isn't any, you know, there are rules which allow this to happen, but um, over the past 10 years or so, I did some, some rough calculations on the way here. In 2016, for every asylum seeker, there was about £10,000 on the aid budget. In 2020, um, it went up to about £27,000 for every asylum seeker. I mean, that's a, that's a problematic statistic for various reasons, but it's a rough sort of back of an envelope indication mm -hmm. that we're spending an awful lot more per individual than we were even five or six years ago. Um, and that's because of a set of choices. And that's not because it suddenly costs two and a half times as much to support an asylum seeker over that period. It's a set of choices to start to classify much more costs um, many of which are unknown, and the, you know, there are a set of costs that the UK calculates, such as housing and accommodation, linked to, to every asylum seeker. But then there's a set of costs around education, around healthcare, which aren't really known. There's just a, a, a rough calculation based on the age of each asylum seeker that it's assumed that is the National Health Service cost. So there's a, a figure which is almost plucked out of thin air, um, to justify some of the ODA budget going towards the NHS in this case to, to support those sorts of costs without any, any certainty or knowledge that those asylum seekers are actually getting those services. In fact, as we know, in many cases, it's very difficult for asylum seekers to get health services in this country. So, so these choices have really resulted in this substantial increase. So I, I think it's... No, it's not, any, it's not really explicable by any change in the external circumstances. I mean, this year, in 2022, it's exceptional because of the Ukraine situation. Mm -hmm. But this increase was happening well before 2022. And I think that illustrates the fact that it, it is a set of policy choices, a set of accountancy choices, really, um, that, that shift more and more of the costs that, that may or may not be associated with supporting refugees and asylum seekers onto the, the ODA budget. So I think that you know, the, these, these policy accounting choices has to be the, the most significant part of this explanation. Thank you. And, and Ian, you have <coughs> estimated that the UK could spend three billion on in-country refugee costs in 2022, which is an increase of 300 percent um, from 2020. How did you reach that figure? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. So I think it's a, it's a combination of the numbers which are, you know, exceptional um, this year and also what, what Michael was referring to, which is, I mean, I think there's probably been two phases. There's been one phase throughout the early 2010s where the government was finding new costs to report. It went from almost zero and to um, up to sort of the 2017, I would guess. And then from that point on, what we've seen is, is, a, is a big increase in the per head costs um, the statistics and international development um, included some detail on that and, and one example is food and shelter costs were, were 4,000 per head um, in 2017 to 19 but in the last two years uh, or in 2021 they were uh, 14,500 per head in food mm -hmm. and shelter and that, that probably ties into what we were hearing from the witnesses earlier about um, the hotel costs so it, it's a combination of those factors I, I think the Ukrainian refugees will be interesting to see what the actual costs and the reported <coughs> costs are. Mm. Um, there's quite an interesting survey of those refugees undertaken by the ONS that shows um, over half of them are now in work um, and so therefore contributing tax to the system. Um, nearly a fifth of them um, are meeting their own accommodation costs. Um, so in some ways, I think actually that scheme could be a model for, you know, for what the cost, the, what, how lower costs could be achieved and how people can contribute more quickly to society and... Um, and integrate more effectively. So, so that will be interesting. And, and if those costs turn out to be lower um, than they are, for example, for asylum seekers, then, then our three billion estimate will, will be an overestimate. So in your assessment, how transparent is the government about the amounts of ODA it spends in the UK? Yeah, I think, I mean, I mean, I mean, I think the, the general point on, on transparency, I think, is that, as Stefan alluded to, you know, the attitude to freedom of information requests and, and openness has gone backwards and, and even decisions that have been taken, like reporting to the OECD, um, the government, you know, appears unclear. Either the FCDO don't know what the costs per refugee were or, or, or they, they say they can't share it. And, and I don't think either of those is, is right. I think the number, I think it's worth saying that the numbers are, are very transparent. Actually, the Home okay. Office numbers of who's, who's arriving is very clear. 
and I have some sympathy with the government in that um, it's hard to know what the costs are in real time. Mm. But that goes back to our last conversation about if you weren't trying to hit a fixed aid ceiling, then that wouldn't really be a problem. You would work out what the costs are afterwards and then you would report them. It, mm. It's only the fact that you're trying to land on this very precise figure that creates this intense scrutiny over, over what those costs are. And Michael, in your assessment, um, how transparent is the government about the amount of ODA it spends in the UK? Uh, and I think there are some figures that are available if you're willing to dig around for them. Um, and it's, it's quite difficult to calculate them. And they're all... And statistics to do with migration are generally problematic all around the world. It's, it's very difficult to get precise assessments. And often you know, we have figures for the number of people who claim asylum this year and then the number of decisions that are made this year and they don't match up for, for obvious reasons. Um, so, so there is a challenge to, to working with these statistics, but, um, but broadly it's, you know, it, it's, it's difficult to get the information. I think I would agree with what's been said um, previously around that. So, um, Michael, in, in regards to transparency, um, do you think there's sufficient transparency of the OJ spending to facilitate scrutiny by Parliament, civil society, taxpayer, taxpayers? Because you're a professor, so yeah. you know where to look. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, there have been some interesting reports recently that the, the government and the governments, the, the UK government's one of, I think, 24 or 25 governments that reported mm. to the OECD okay. details oh. of, of expenditure. In 2017, the OECD released a series of clarifications around the categorisation of, mm. um, of in donor refugee costs as, as ODA. Um, and, and then invited governments to report on how they classified that. Um, and, and the UK's response to that provided some information about, for example, the, the calculation of you know, how much is, is um, uh, allocated per refugee for NHS costs. Um, mm. Other governments, in their response to that, um, and the, the French response I've read in some detail, um, said, we don't do this. You know, we don't, if, if we don't know a per individual cost, then we don't report any costs at all. Okay. Um, so so they're, they're both you know, relatively transparent. I mean, I think there's, there's a degree of honesty in not knowing a cost and therefore not reporting it as ODA, um, whereas... You know, attempting to come up with some calculations based on the fact that there might be some relationship, I think, is, is inherently problematic. Um, and, and that is very difficult to tease out from these reports. Okay. Um, so it, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a question of days of work to, uh, to investigate that. It's not, it's not immediately obvious what's going on. And Ian, would you like to add to that at all? I, I suppose I, I can see Stefan wants well, to. Stefan's uh, trying to come in on. <laughs> Go for it, Stefan. <laughs> I, mean, I think there's a wider problem with transparency. You know, the, the, the government uh, previously had committed to um, um, very good on the aid transparency <laughs> index um, in its last strategy. It was one of the only concrete targets in the last strategy. It didn't meet it. Now it's dropped it and committed to improvement. Um, so, so I think the government, uh, by its own admission, has, has gone backwards on transparency. I, I think on refugees and asylum seekers, I've, I've got some more sympathy with the, you know, the ability to report in real time is difficult, I think. Thank you. Stefan, sorry, I didn't see you waving there. <laughs> no, that's all right. That's all right. I'm far away. Um, no, I just wanted to add, make a slight distinction between kind of reporting exposed and actually being willing to be transparent in real time. You know, I sat on the other side, so to speak, in FCDO, trying to actually help to manage the uncertainties, you know, what is essentially, as, as the, the other speakers are referring to, the kind of uncertainty in this, but trying to manage it and, you know, not getting the information inside government even in terms of the clarity of what's going on. Um, and, and so that is actually also very weak, that uh, there is very little idea really about what the costs and, and how they're being managed. And, and, and I have to make this point, is that unlike any other government budget, um, if I'm another government department, uh, especially for refugee costs, this is essentially an open-ended envelope. If I misspent it, it will still come on OTA and it will squeeze out the development budget. If, I, if I'm inefficient and if I don't book the hotels in time, it doesn't really matter. I can pay the rack rate. It doesn't matter. OTA will pay for it. Mm. And that incentives are really, really wrong. 
and actually also very untransparent of how is it handled. So it gives a lot of problem for those in FCD who try to financially manage it because they carry all the time the residual risk mm. of basically the inefficiencies in the rest of the system, which would never happen in any other government budget. And that's actually is quite an important point, point to make. Then on transparency, I would still say that, you know, we may have a bit of sympathy, but I thought, for example, the answers that Baroness Suck got in the Lords, in the House of Lords, uh, on her parliamentary questions are definitely, you know, we would hope that they do their homework a bit better and give some clear answers to relatively clear questions. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you. Um, it, it's the lack of clarity is the driver for why we're doing this um, inquiry, because we are unable to get the actual costs. Um, and I think the point that you made, Stefan, that FCDO is taking the brunt of another part department's um, spending was well said when Sir Philip Barton a couple of months ago said he didn't know what his budget was anymore. And uh, last week, the development minister said that the budget was out of control over the summer, which is very <laughs> chilling to hear. Um, Chris, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good to see you again, Stefan. And I can tell you now, I've actually completed your book, You're Gabbling on Development, which was excellent, so I hope that's a free plug for you. Um, what I wanted to ask you was, um, based on your experience working with DFID, has there been sufficient oversight of order spending by other government departments, or is it just basically an easy place for blank cheques to be written from? Yes, well... The, That's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, actually, yes. No, the, but the, the, importantly, I do think, and I've always thought it was a mistake, to not allow DFIT and now FCDO to have a very tight control over ODA spending in other government departments. Mm -hmm. The decision at the time by, uh, I think it was in 2015, by Chancellor Osborne mm. to actually make it essentially a budget that should be used whole of government, it led, of course, to a budget that was allowing plugging of holes and, uh, in, 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 in their budgets as well. But what has really got lost is this sense of probably twofold. One is a real sense of um, control that is this really in the spirit and at the core of what development spending should be about? And secondly, is this actually being managed uh, in a way that, you know, those people at the time in different knows, many of them now in FCDO, knew how to manage these budgets in these very difficult places. You know, these are very messy environments we need to spend that money on. And basically to have it all the time in the spirit of, and not necessarily within the letter, but in the spirit of the of the ODA principles in terms of how to spend it. So I, I do think that derailment, that the money had to be spent by all these other government departments is partly responsible. I'm not trying to say that all that money was badly spent. There's some incredibly um, good and, and honest and sincere uh, people interested in development, but it, it led to this total departure from a sensible control around what should development spending of the UK be about and secondly you know is it actually effectively managed uh, in the way that the, the best experts are keeping an eye on it. Thank you Stephen and I just wonder what your thoughts were in terms of the merger <laughs> because there was plenty of opining coming from the Foreign Office that don't have enough money and certainly not money ring fence for their office and perhaps one of the reasons for its mergers uh, with DFID was to get its hands on more money for itself. Do you agree with that? And is there any evidence that different departments may have conflicting priorities? Yes. Um, look, I have no doubt, and I, I've lived through the time when the secondary, the secondary benefit feels like it becomes more important than the primary benefit. And the endless looking for secondary benefits to justify what we'll be doing, it is clearly not in the spirit of uh, how uh, ODA spending should be done. To be clear, you know, basically the DAC rules allow that there is a secondary benefit to the UK, as long as the primary benefit is really the, the economic development and welfare of developing countries. And yes, that always felt like the case. Can we, can we make that maximizing the secondary benefit? And who cares really about the primary? Now, the, that, and I think that is, that is, a, that is a, a, an absolutely something I, I've observed. And, um, and I think it's partly at, 
the, the, the root of the of, of, of the problem. You know, we should go back to principal development spending, mm. spending that basically say, OK, what does it do for development? And if it has a benefit for the UK, it's good. It's a small part of the budget, maybe around one percent or less of the overall government spending. Just do it well. That's how we got to be a development superpower, by being always recognized internationally as doing this. And from the moment we created ambiguity about it, that trying to chase other objectives, uh, then, then it is a problem. Now, specifically on FCO and FCDO now, but the foreign office part of our merged department. One thing I definitely learned being in, the, in, in, in private office and supporting uh, foreign secretaries is that so clearly that the Treasury decided to stop giving money basically for foreign policy in lower and middle income countries. And then, of course, they were saying we have no more money because only, only if they could do it with ODA, and then, of course, it gets in trouble. I'm a big fan of actually funding a foreign office sensibly. You know, it's okay to support British business. It's okay to actually do counterterrorism. It's okay to do international crime uh, protection for the UK in that respect. There's all these things are fine, but give them a budget for it and don't try to squeeze it in an aid budget, which then will be badly spent for development and badly spent for foreign policy. And I'm afraid that's where we are. And it also undermines our global leadership and development as well, I would assume. Um, my last question to you, Stefan, really, is um, Andrew Mitchell's been a, a big supporter from the back benches of where um, international development needs to go, and it will, time will tell now that he's a minister. But he said in a recent interview in The Times he proposed the creation of a sort of star chamber to scrutinise allocation of the development budget around Whitehall. Do you think that's a good idea? So, for me, it has to start from a shared commitment within government mm -hmm. to actually wanting to spend development money well. And it actually should come from from level of the Prime Minister, it should come from uh, other cabinet members being willing to really and generally wanting to do it. Because the star chambers, I've seen them, when we had to do the cuts, we were trying to run these star, uh, the star chambers, and this is not a new idea. But it has to be actually being principled and not trying to squeeze it, squeeze all kinds of spending that is not really development through because it's really good for the UK or whatever it is. So it's not about the form it takes, it's actually the underlying commitment that the people that are members of that star chamber will have that will determine whether the outcome is going to be good for development or not. But it could be a step. So I'm sympathetic to it. And if they can pull it off, and if uh, Andrew Mitchell can, can be given the authority to be really pursuing development results and really can tell, you know, any department, Department of Health, the uh, other departments, base, whatever it is, what they show that they that this is not really good development and stop certain programs. I'm happy with that. But uh, we have to be seen because it's not the first time that the Star Chamber has been used. And it all has to be about the underlying commitment to development that, that, that is at the core of it. And that's what we need to see changing now first. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Nigel. Isn't the, one of the risks here that sort of strange rules drive us to do strange things? And I mean, I, I think it's right to say that once the year ticks by in next spring, we can't count supporting the UK as ODA and we can't count supporting Poland as ODA, but we could count supporting Moldova or Ukraine as ODA because both territories are on the ODA list. So that might mean that we move from doing what we think is best for people who've been displaced to doing what we think is best for a bizarre budget calculation. And that would be a perverse outcome for this. It's, Stefan, you're nodding. So, I mean, what's the solution to that? Do we just make the ODA 12-month rule, 24-month rule, or do we have to go and find more money? I mean, what is the solution the government should take here? You know, actually, spending should follow sensible policy decisions. You know, you have to, if you're committed to do something, we should be willing to allocate resources to it. I think previous speakers uh, earlier said, you know, there are, there are good reasons to support, you know, here or overseas what is happening with refugees. The ODA rules are more like norms of behavior. We do not have to squeeze it in it. I think it was simply a mistake to try to squeeze it in now for our own accountancy purposes. Accountancy should never drive policy. And I think that's where we are. Accountancy is driving policy. And the dilemma that you described comes from that. 
you know, if we decide we really want to support these Ukrainian refugees, we should be allocating public resources for it. And if we later on feel like reporting that to the DAC, that should be fine. But we should not also, as Ian said earlier, treat it as, oh, well, everything must be squeezed into that other thing, that 0.5 or whatever it is, 0.55 of the budget. We shouldn't let accountancy drive policy. Policy should then say, well, is it worth spending money on it? Let's actually do it. So if we want to support these refugees, let's support it and let's then do effective policy. And then let the accountants count it how we should count it. That would just be a much healthier way of public policy. And I fear in the last few years, this is not the only example. I've seen countless examples where accountancy rules policy. And that doesn't seem right to me. It and perhaps the other, I mean, I agree with that, of course. And, and perhaps the other example of a, I mean, all rules and definitions and measures and targets have these sorts of effects to, to some extent. And it's, it's about how seriously the decision makers take them. And I think it would be great to move to a situation where that was a tertiary consideration, as you say, you know, where, where should we provide the support? Um, I guess another one to flag, though, is the, um, the, when we were talking earlier about priorities in departments and cuts, last year when the government was making its um, big cut from 0.7 to 0.5. One of the areas it increased spending was on um, British um, international investment, and and substantially so. And, and the reason it did so is because of the Treasury had set it a target in the spending review, and that target was to spend a certain amount of so-called non-fiscal ODA, which is spending that doesn't count towards the government's expenditure when it does its annual reporting to the OBR and so on. And so so even aside from the 0.5 and ODA, there are other targets that are, are creating perverse behaviours because I think, um, I mean, it's very, it, it, you know, as Stefan and, and ministers have said, it was implementing the cuts last year was very difficult and this year it's very difficult. There's only certain budgets to be cut, but there's a clear policy choice there, which is a substantial increase for BII alongside deep cuts to our health and, and social budgets, which is which is born of, of, of another problematic measure, I guess. Michael. Just to mention another bizarre restriction that, that we're bound by is that the, the money um, from from ODA that's spent on refugees can't be spent on integration. And, and obviously it's uncertain exactly what integration involves, but when it was first introduced in 2015, 2016, there was an explanation that the, the cut in government funding for English language courses was because English language teaching was part of integration, which couldn't then um, be classified as, as ODA. That's since been clarified by OECD that language instruction can be used within this first year. But there's various sorts of tertiary courses which can't be supported. So there's a, there's a range of restrictions on how we support refugees in that first year that are imposed by this desire to classify this as ODA that mean we're not supporting refugees very well, which um, I think is a further illustration of these, uh, these points. There's a real danger to the tails wagging the dog in this mm. situation. <coughs> well, I simply saw in Moldova last week this sort of problem of the best way to provide healthcare to refugees is to make the Moldovan healthcare system work, but if you're not careful... That's not what you meant to do, even though that's clearly the right thing to do. And, and, that, and equally, we committed to a, a few projects, and then we couldn't get the money out in time, so they had to go and find somebody else to do it. I mean, are we not just in danger of the, you know, the volatility and the uncertainty making us an unreliable development partner that no one's actually going to want to uh, do projects with because they think they might get canned halfway through or something? I mean, are we, is there a realistic danger that we start to get into that position? I think we've already got into that position. I mean, the, <laughs> one of the reasons why the, the UK's, uh, you know, this, this development superpower reputation has now largely been trashed is, mm. is not simply because of the cuts, but because the cuts have fallen on ongoing projects that were contracted, that had been planned, and then halfway through they're cut, or that there's cuts and then there's uncertainty about the cuts and some of them are put back again. It's the management of those cuts which has been so problematic and I think has really resulted in, in a damage to this reputation. So that, you know, the situation that you describe, I think, is already, already here. And, and just briefly to add to that, I mean, you, you know, we've been through a period of a global pandemic which hurt developing countries more than us, you know, a war in Ukraine, which increased food prices, which are much higher, you know, much higher in lower income countries because of their budgetary the amount of money that's spent on food in, you know, in lower income countries is much higher than ours. Um, and then coming down the road, we're going to have some sort of commitment to rebuilding Ukraine um, and, and supporting the partner countries. And if through all of that you say, you know, our fiscal contribution to this is exactly what it was beforehand, then, then you're going to face these sorts of 
sort of difficult choices and seem an unreliable partner. So, it's, so for me, it's about you know broadening our horizon and, and seeing the changing needs in the world and having a kind of response rather than focusing inward and saying, well, you know, we've got fiscal difficulties here, so we all need to fit in this envelope, and and that can't change. We've produced a mess, really, haven't we? I mean, that's the we have. A, I mean, that's the that's going to be the. The, the answer I suspect to this is primarily the answer is it matters less how much you spend that you spend it in a predictable and reliable way that people can have trust mm-hmm. in and that would be that would be better than, than playing numbers games to hit arbitrary targets in effect okay. mm-hmm. thank you thank you um, for clarity um, you, you've all spoken about how technically the um, spending uh, in the UK is permitted under the OECD DAC rules. But can I just ask you to say the same questions to, that I put to the first panel? Do you think that it is right to do so, and is it ethical and moral to do so? Um, Stefan, could I ask you? Um, so, so I don't think it's right to do so, and, it is, and the moral choices that derive from it are, um, are are dreadful. Um, so I don't think it's right. It's not in the spirit of of how we historically thought about development assistance. And um, yeah, and I think simply we shouldn't count costs in the UK of this nature towards the, this budget. Thank you, um, Ian. What are your thoughts? Yeah, not much to add. I, I mean, I think that's right. I don't think it should be counted as ODA. Um, I think, don't think it would be so problematic if we were just reporting it and not reducing other aid. That's the that's the key for me. Um, and you know, the, the, I think I think one of the earlier questions was about it does need paying for. You know, I mean, it either needs to become out of taxation, or we need to borrow, or we need to reduce spending. But the only spending we've reduced is the foreign aid budget. There's been no attempt in all the other government departments or spend. There's been there's been no reduction. So I, yeah, I think for that reason, it's yeah, it's, it's it's hard to defend. Um, and Michael, uh, Lord Harrington yesterday on Radio 4 uh, said overseas aid is for overseas. What happens in the UK should not be from the overseas aid budget. Um, you're nodding. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, as, as other speakers have said, and I think the, no, just to the only thing I would add is that I think it does create these perverse disincentives to A, to spend money efficiently because it's almost like a blank check as um, I think Stefan was, was pointing out and B, it's, it restricts spending in certain ways like you know, however we classify integration over that first year um, it's, um, it, it doesn't mean we have a very efficient um, asylum or refugee system if we're trying to make that asylum and refugee system fit these these ODA definitions. So it's bad for, for overseas development overseas, and it's bad for asylum and refugee mm-hmm. policy in the UK. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, all of you, uh, for your well, work ongoing in this field. It's, it's really helping us do our job, um, but also for your um, honesty today. And I think what's come across most to me is the two um, organisations, the Refugee Council and International Rescue Committee that we had first, the services they're delivering in the UK, are ones that we know from our inquiry into um, long-term refugees overseas that they will be delivering from the ODA budget but they don't seem to know if it's coming from the ODA budget in this country or not. Um, We've got a session at the end of January where we'll have the Home Office, Treasury and FCDO in front of us because one way or the other we are going to get to the bottom of this um, and I kind of think it might be kicking and screaming rather than a more gentle approach but let's hope that I'm proved wrong by the end of January. Um, Thank you very much for all of your help. Um, Order, order, this session is now closed.